Coming up on Market to Market, Secretary Purdue gets a first-hand look at derecho damaged areas, adjusting an agritourism business plan in the middle of a pandemic. Who this? But no, it's and market analysis with Elaine Cobb next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, September 4 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. With less than two months remaining until the election, rural America is taking stock of what has happened over the past four years and the past four weeks. 1.4 million jobs were created last month, the fewest since hiring restarted four months ago. The increase helped drop the unemployment rate nearly two percentage points to 8.4 percent, the first time below 10 percent since March. The Creighton Mid-America Business Conditions Index continued its rise above growth neutral even as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. The move higher came before USDA estimated farm income, which, if realized, will be almost 22 percent above last year, but still more than 25 percent below the peak in 2013. Action with biofuels, recovery from recent storms, and the threat of a looming drought are now directly in front of rural Americans. This week, one of President Trump's cabinet came to the Midwest to look over the damage and offer some relief. John Torpy has more. On a windblown Iowa farm, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue brought welcome news for those affected by the recent derecho storm that raged across the Hawkeye State. I'm here to announce that Iowa is qualified for a secretarial disaster, which will unlock the, uh, the, the USDA programs for, Ameri for Iowa farmers. So I'm going to sign that right here now. With the stroke of a pen, Secretary Purdue designated 18 Iowa counties as primary natural disaster areas. The move clears the way for farmers impacted by last month's derecho storm to apply for emergency loans with the USDA. The signing ceremony was held after the secretary took a helicopter tour of damaged fields and farms. Secretary Purdue was joined on the flight by Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds, U.S. Senator Joni Ernst, and Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Negg. The infusion of funds is in addition to $4 billion in disaster relief already allocated by President Trump. I have the heart of a farmer as a farm boy. Sad, somber, sobering, uh, and uh, uh, heartbreaking for people who put their sweat, blood, and tears in the crop to produce it. Looking forward to good harvest, almost to the point there of beginning a harvest, and uh, and then just just devastation. Last month's derecho ripped through seven midwestern states, inflicting devastating damage on farmers and ranchers living along the storm's 770-mile path. Iowa received the brunt of the storm's wrath. Overall, 14 million acres were smashed by the straight-line windstorm, with nearly 6 million of those acres either heavily damaged or destroyed. But the real numbers are yet to be revealed as farmers plan for the upcoming harvest. According to officials at Iowa State University, corn that was damaged in the storm is susceptible to disease which could further cut yields. Those crops that survived the storm, along with many other fields in the Midwest, are now in a fight with a drought. According to the U.S. Drought Monitor, areas experiencing abnormally dry conditions have decreased slightly, thanks in part to heavy rains brought in by Hurricane Laura. However, over the months of June, July, and August, the numbers of affected areas have expanded. Strings of hot, dry days with above-normal temperatures have denied some crops rain that in the past 
might have averaged anywhere from 6 to 10 inches. For some farmers, the storm damage and the drought are piled on top of issues in the ethanol industry. Corn growers and ethanol producers continue to press the federal government to stop granting small refinery exemptions, or SREs. The exemptions allow petroleum refiners to bypass federal rules requiring the blending of biofuels into gasoline. Petroleum refiners argue the hardship waivers are necessary as the global pandemic has crushed demand for fuel. The obligation up here is going to be 15 billion gallons plus what's ever granted to equal a net of 15 billion gallons. That's what the law calls for, and that's what the president's committed, and that's what we expect. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. If you're running a business that relies on customers to come in the door or pass the farm gate, the pandemic has been particularly hard on your bottom line. But one challenge can open the door to opportunity. Nathan and Talena Ryder left the worlds of television news and the hospitality industry to try their hand at farming. The couple has had to switch up the business plan on their CSA-style operation and along the way provided a much-needed service to their downstate Illinois community. You can see the entire interview with the couple from Golconda via next week's M2M podcast. Tonight, we feature them in our cover story. Boy, put me on the spot. Okay, so we are a 10-acre diversified farm operation. We're not organically certified, but we try to grow things as organically as possible. Um, you know, and really we want to gear ourselves towards agritourism. Like we want to have people come out and see how their food grows and visit with animals and enjoy themselves and share this kind of slice of heaven that we have, you know, with them. So, um, so how did agritourism look in 2018 and 2019? If I would come out on a Saturday, uh, for a visit, what did it look like at your place? Uh, small in the beginning. Yeah, very small. Um, you would probably have the place to yourself. (laughs) <laughs> and you would have a uh, one-on-one personal tour around through the garden and to see the chickens and, you know, you would get to hang out for a long time. Uh, so, yeah, we're coming into this this season, we're expecting things to be a little busier. Uh, we know people have been cooped up and you know, there's a lack of activities for people to do, especially in COVID. And so we're almost a little like on edge right we're now scared. about... <laughs> <laughs> the influx of people that we might end up with at the farm. And so like everything, we'll just roll with the punches and I'm sure it'll be a learning experience for us and we'll grow from it. So, Well, were the big changes for 2020 because of COVID or were they more because of the lessons you'd learned in 18 and 19 and knew you needed to move the mums, like you said, uh, from here to there? I think it's been a mix of both. I mean, we learned a lot of things that we wanted to do differently business-wise, like from getting to know our clientele better, who buys moms, when do they buy them, um, how do we get them ready before the Walmart has them ready, you know, all of that stuff. But then um, everything kind of like changed when COVID happened because everybody needed food. Like there were no eggs in the grocery store. Um, People were nervous about how how well farms were going to do, and they didn't know if they were going to have produce. You know, is the grocery store going to have produce in the summer? Like, I don't know. Let me buy your CSA share. Um, And so we just kind of like adapted as best as we could to what the clients were asking for, what the customers wanted. We saw that we sold out of our CSA share. So we were like, oh, well, let's add more. Can we grow more? How much can we do? Um, definitely pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone in terms of growing before we were ready to grow, you know, before we would have done it ourselves. And so for that, that's kind of been a silver lining, I think, in the whole COVID pandemic for our business model is that it's forced us to rethink things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Talena had to spend hours upon hours sort of retooling our website and our e-commerce platform and putting products online and setting it up so that people could schedule a time to pull up into our driveway and Mm -hmm. pick up stuff that they'd already paid for. Uh, We had to all of a sudden expand our refrigeration capacity. So we had the ability to hold stuff for customers. 
um, aside from our normal pickup days. So yeah, it's, there've been a lot of interesting growing points this year. And I think that's part of the reason why we're so like, you know, yeah, exhausted. It's, it's been a lot early on. Yeah. So, so, so um, we're okay. At what month did you notice that you needed to make these changes? I mean, March is when a lot of the country started to head into that lockdown mode. So was it late March, April, May? It was when March. you noticed you needed to make yeah, a change? It was almost right away. I mean, yeah. I, I think there was probably about a week, just like everybody else, there was a week of sort of shock and awe of, yeah. is this really happening? Like, what's going on? And then from that point, I think, yeah, we knew pretty quickly, like, we had to step it up. Yeah, in March, our soap sales went through the roof, and we were even offering to deliver eggs and soap to elderly people who couldn't get mobile and come to the farm and get what they needed. But I mean, our local grocery store had no eggs for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it's spring. Chickens don't lay a whole lot of eggs when it's that cold still. So, you know, we were selling eggs as fast as they were laying them and delivering and getting them ready for pickup. And it was just right away. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> and then they were like, it. where's the produce? And we're like, it's still cold. You have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> you might be in southern you might be in extreme southern illinois but it's not that warm there to be growing produce in march yeah. no it was not not okay i mean and we we were putting up a high tunnel too mm -hmm. i mean we had just got uh all of our materials for a high tunnel and so well nathan was not working his off farm job but we were like okay let's get that high tunnel up and see how soon we can get the first produce out of it and our first thing was potatoes yeah. And but I mean, we just keep adapting and keep pushing in. Next, the market to market report. The market played give and take much of the week in price discovery over the impact of dry conditions and overall demand for the week. December wheat improved two cents while the nearby corn contract declined a penny. The soybean compact complex paid closer attention to the weather forecast. The November soybean contract continued higher this week by 18 cents. December soybean meal improved 750 per ton. December cotton contracted by 9 cents per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, October class 3 milk futures rallied again this time at a $1.21 gain. A mixed week in the livestock sector. October cattle fell 45 cents. October feeders declined $1.68. And the October lean hog contract jumped up $6.18, or nearly 12%. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index rose 33 ticks. October crude oil declined 3.20 per barrel. Comex Gold sold off by 30.70 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell nearly 12 points to finish at 348.20. Joining us now to give us some insight is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub. Elaine, good to see you again. Good to be here. Let's start with wheat, Elaine. Uh, we talk about price discovery. First you're up, then you're down, then you're up, then you're down. How much longer does this continue, and is it going to go up or down? Well, it's up overall, and I think one of the driving forces of that is short covering from the funds. You know, you do sort of look at all of these grain contracts, and a lot of the ag contracts generally are sort of drifting upwards. That seems to be the general direction, and you think that that might be some bullish sentiment, but I actually think it's just that short covering and the removal of risk. You mentioned the dry weather. That dry weather is there for wheat also, so you could start to make a bullish case uh, here in the United States right before hard red winter wheat planting season gets started because of all that dryness, particularly the long-term drought in Colorado. But honestly, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's just part of the, the larger complex. And like I mentioned, the risk removal, people just don't want to be short in this environment when everything else is going up. So if you're at 550 now on that December contract, does that have, are you making a sale yet? Well, you know, sure, fine. I mean, that's not a, it's not a terrible price, but I think the motivation for selling wheat right now is more logistical. I think there's better opportunities for storing corn, honestly, past December when you look at the, the spreads, particularly in that Chicago contract you mentioned. The spread from December to March is only, I think, eight and a half cents. 
So you've got better opportunities to put corn in your bins and, and get rid of the wheat before harvest. Well, corn was actually pulled higher by wheat on Tuesday, but you mentioned some jitteriness in corn. There's concerns in China uh, among the people there, at least to, to, to one report this week, that uh, there's food inflation. It's climbed to its highest in over a decade. Is that pulling this corn market higher? I think a lot of the rumors out of China are the idea that they might be moving their their supplies around or their stockpiles around. That food inflation is more of a of a factor of the pork prices, I think, still lingering from the 2019 African swine fever issue that they had there. But it's been very positive for the U.S. corn market to see export sales going to China. I mean, that's that has been a, a huge boost to corn and a big fundamental story for soybeans, of course, but also for corn. You know, we just started a new marketing year here on September 1st, and already looking at the new crop commitments, export commitments of corn, it's at a record high level. So so we have nothing but positive things to say about exports right now, and China is the, the big player there. So the question then becomes, are you selling right now? I mean, we've talked about counter seasonality for the last couple of weeks. Are you buying into that or has that kind of started to evaporate? Uh, do you sell going into this harvest, I guess is my question. I think looking at corn sales for the 2020 marketing year, you know, you've got to just look at the price. 360 futures. If this was February and you, and you knew that you were going to have 360 futures going into harvest, you would not be complaining too much. That would not be a terrible scenario. And because we still have such ample stocks, such ample supplies, which we're going to see again in next week's uh, WASD report, you know, where the market is going to get a reminder that there's not really a shortage of corn or feed grains globally or certainly in the United States. Because of that, it's hard to get uh, real excited about hugely better opportunities. And if this is a price where you can make a profit, um, yeah, you know, harvest, you t tend to dwindle lower. So maybe it's not a bad idea. So this is more of a grouping than a bullish trend ahead? Yeah, I think the, okay. the outlook for corn prices, I would say, is neutral. It's not perhaps urgent to be locking in prices, but it's not a terrible idea either. Do you like that March price at all, 368 and a half today? Are you selling that at all? Or are you holding well, again, there is better carry opportunities in the corn than in some of the other markets. So, yeah, if you've got uh, the, the opportunity to store it on farm, capture some of that carry, move into the, the later marketing seasons into 2021, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to capture that. Elaine, we know you love basis questions, so we made sure that Aaron in Ocheed in Iowa sent us one. Here's his question that he gave to us via Twitter. It's asking, what's grain basis going to do once combines roll? One rule of thought is harvest pressure and farmers' lack of prior selling will really widen things out. While another thought is, at least here, and he's in northwest Iowa, the drought duration yields will keep it tight. What do you think? Well, I have been worried about weakening basis throughout the United States as we go into harvest, just because we have such, you know, sort of oppressive supplies that are likely to come Certainly in some areas of the Corn Belt, Indiana, for instance, they're looking at record high yields. You know, we could just have a lot of corn to handle. You could get into the gut slot of harvest and really have a basis weakening. But all basis is local. And I think Aaron's question is really uh, relevant to right there in the center of Iowa right now, where it really is that question where you might not have the supplies. You might have a local scenario where um, the market might really be scrambling for corn and you could start to get a tightening. But I I think right now what we're seeing, the expectation from the elevators in central Iowa is more regular sort of basis levels, something right about close to your studio there or maybe even up by Boone or thereabouts. Those elevators are 45 under the December for October, November delivery. That's pretty normal. And I think it might be a little bit wide, might be a bit of a reflection of the struggles that the elevators themselves had, the damage they had from the derecho. So I think Aaron is right to point out that it could really go either way. We're going to need to get into harvest to see those effects. But right now, my bias would be towards weaker basis or, or the danger of weaker basis as we get into harvest. Say we get an inch of rain over the weekend or Tuesday, Wednesday. Corn, it doesn't really matter. Is it going to save a soybean crop that needs to be saving in some parts? Or is there enough acres out there, Elaine, on soybeans that are doing okay? And a rain's not uh, going really, to, they don't need it as much. Yeah, it depends. It depends where that rain falls. I think some of the soybeans were so dry during August and they probably, the plants were shutting down to a degree where it might be too late. Uh, we might certainly be seeing early harvests going on for soybeans and for corn. 
But at this point, um, look at the pod filling. There is still the chance for some of these uh, soybean fields to continue to pod fill. But my concern going into next week is not necessarily whether or not uh, the areas that need rain get rain, but whether the areas in the northern part of the Corn Belt get frost. I think that was a, a, a maybe just a you know not a rumor. I mean, it's part of a, of a weather forecast that may or may not happen. But I think that was a motivator to some of the higher prices we saw here on Friday. It's like you were listening in to Phil and I having a conversation before we started. We were just talking about that frost, if we would get it here. It wouldn't matter in the dry area, but if you've got a good crop, you are worried about that. So uh, I guess I ask you on soybeans, we talk about price discovery. It was up, it was down. There was a huge swing. I think it was a 50 cent swing in three trading sessions to start uh, the week. And then we move higher at the end. So I guess my question, Elaine, is are we going higher? Are we in a bullish trend? I think, yeah, we are, we are seeing some higher prices. Apologies for the dog. It's like we're on but, a Zoom um, meeting. And we, oh, that's okay. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> this happens all the time, right? She knows about higher soybean prices. But <laughs> uh, we are going higher. And I think it's fundamentally based on these export sales that I talked about, record high soybean sales also at this time of year. And, uh, you, you know, we, we see that. And it may or may not be able to continue much higher than where it is right now. But it is based on fundamentals and it's based, you know, I, I mentioned in the feed grains or in the wheat, it's a lot of short covering, you know, just removal of risk. But in the soybean market, it's fundamental commercial traders covering those export sales. That's what's moving the soybeans higher on those days that you see the double digit higher days. And it's also the funds experiencing that story about the exports, but also the damage that we received during the dry August and the potential damage that we might receive from this frost. All of these are fundamental stories that are really legitimately pushing that soybean price higher. It's always not what's happening in your backyard, but in many other backyards across the key growing area. Good question or good point there, Elaine. Let's move to the livestock complex in cattle. This is usually one of those slow down times uh, where the lots are kind of slowing down. The, the trade not real active this week, except heading down. Is, is that a cause of lower volume or is there something else underfoot? Well, you know, it couldn't have lasted forever. We saw prices where I think cattle owners and cattle feeders were happy when you had $111 live and 150 feeders, but it just, it couldn't go up forever and it couldn't last forever. And it's pretty typical to get a, a high put in there in July or August, August in this case. And we have just been moving lower for the past three weeks. It's not, it's still not terrible. I mean, I don't think that cattle owners uh, should feel um, terrible. I mean, the feeder prices themselves are still slightly higher than they were last year at this time. And everybody's kind of making money. You know, it, it, the market fundamentals are still there to, to keep it from perhaps falling apart. I don't think, for instance, that we'll see live cattle prices fall below $100. We saw uh, cash cattle trade this week at 102 or 103. And hopefully, you know, there's just not enough room or willingness from the feedlots to sell much lower than that. You stole one of my questions. I was going to ask you on October 1st, are we going to be above or below 100? And you answered that one right there. So feeders, we just showed the chart while we were talking. Uh, are we still feeling the effects of that cattle on feed report? Is there something else going on? Yeah, and, and you mentioned about the time of the year also, is that we're just still about a month out from the big runs through the sale barns. You know, the, the calf crop just isn't ready yet, and we haven't had a chance to really test what the feed yard's appetite is going to be for those calves. When we do test it, there have been, you know, a few sales here and there. There seems to be good demand, moderate demand for, for, for steers. So I think, you know, I think it should be able to maintain this level and not too surprising that it's, that it's fallen through the past three weeks. In the hog market, is $60 a reality next week? I think very possibly, very possibly. I mean, the fundamentals behind that market is, again, it's exports, but you're seeing the uh, the cutout values, the ribs, the hams, those kind of primals are really leading, you know, big jumps this week. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a fluke. It wasn't a speculative bubble. It was it was a, a real price uh, appreciation for pork and for hogs themselves. And I think it is possible for that market to churn a little bit higher. It wouldn't have to get too much higher to hit that 60 level that you mentioned. Um, yeah, let's let's aim for it, I guess. Well, it's not that far away. I got I lost it here. 59.83 is where we closed on Friday. So it's within shouting distance at least. So uh, I'll close quickly here on the cotton market, Elaine. Uh, that is one that has been waving at us, and now it looks like it's waving lower. Your best 30 seconds on cotton. 
Yeah, the chart looks kind of mild, doesn't it? Like it's just moving higher along with the rest of the ag commodities. However, I don't think cotton has yet really factored in some of the dryness in the United States, poor conditions, only 44% good to excellent, and some of the exports. The export story that has been boosting soybeans and pork, you could make the same story for cotton, and the chart has not put it in yet. Elaine, thank you for allowing me to put cotton in right at the end. <laughs> and the rest You're of our welcome. discussion. Thanks, Elaine. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus, so you can join us there. Find it on our website of markettomarket.org. Now, the entire interview with the Ryder family will be the next M2M podcast. You can find it along with other extended interviews on our website. Next week, we'll look at how ranchers are living side by side with a returning predator. Until then, thanks for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.